of uh, Euroactive Slovakia and Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. Um, welcome uh, online. Next time, hopefully, uh, we all hope uh, in person. Uh, my name is Lucia Jar. I'm an editor in chief, acting editor in chief of Euroactive Slovakia a web portal. And it is really my utmost pleasure to welcome you all at today's discussion. Uh, which is very timely and we believe still very important, but not enough discussed, particularly in Slovakia. Discussion is titled European Digital Services and Markets, Taming of Digital Giants. It's with question marks, so we will see what we can get out of that. Uh, we intended uh, to really discuss the latest development uh, on the upcoming legislation, both Digital Services Act, which is related to services and Digital Markets Act or DSA, DMA, uh, which are very heavily discussed since, it's, since their publication in December. But we see that the debate is ongoing a lot in Brussels, a lot in uh, many European capitals, but it's kind of missing in smaller states, including Slovakia, maybe even Malta, maybe some, some other countries. Uh, overall, we are glad that you logged in and we hope that we will expand the knowledge that you so far have about those uh, two uh, legislation, upcoming legislation, which actually really have a potential to not only change the European markets and services, but go really beyond. And it will ultimately uh, concern every single one of us. I'm very glad uh, that uh, we were able to put uh, together this discussion, uh, invite really crucial people who have uh, an important voice within the overall debate in Europe. And also I would like to thank you for helping us to bring it uh, to our audience, uh, to our partner, uh, Friedrich Ebert Foundation, Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, uh, and its representation in Slovakia. Uh, before I give a floor to Mr. Uh, Urban Uveshar, who is representing uh, Friedrich Ebert uh, Foundation, let me quickly introduce uh, our panel today, because as I said, we really have uh, an important uh, speakers. Um, firstly, let me turn to Malta, uh, to Mr. Alex Agim Saliba, who is member of the European Parliament for uh, SND party. Uh, and he was also appointed as a reporter of the Digital Services Act by the Internal Market and Consumer Protection Committee uh, in the European Parliament. That's why uh, we have him over here. Welcome. Thanks a lot um, for your invite and I'm really looking forward for this discussion today. Thank you. Thank you for coming, for logging in. Uh, Mr. Ljubos Kuklis, Director of the Council for Broadcasting and Retransmission of Slovakia. Bratislava, welcome. Thank you for inviting me. And Mr. Michał Kanovnik, uh, President of Zipsy Digital Poland Association, which is an association of importers and producers of electrical and electronic equipment. Welcome. Thank you very much for your invitation. And I'm sure that with this debate uh, will be very, very um, uh, successful and in interesting for our audience. Thank you, thank you, and, and hopefully we, we hope as well. Uh, so before I hand over the floor uh, to Mr. Ubersha, uh, last information or and also expression of the gratitude to our audience. Uh, we have uh, participants, uh, an audience that is logged in here on Zoom, and also we have participants uh, watching us online uh, streaming on Facebook. Um, and the third way, which other people will be listening to us, mostly listening, uh, will be on podcast, which uh, will be available also at Curactive. Uh, what I would like to very much encourage you is to participate in this debate. Um, you are very much encouraged to uh, raise your hand. Everybody knows that a button by now. Uh, we can let you speak. We can see you. We will be very much happy to, to have some of your opinions. Uh, and also you can write your questions to the section of Q and A's down um, at, the, at the bar uh, on Zoom. Again, thank you very much. We have representation from the state, from academia, from think tanks, from business industry. So I'm, I'm, really, I'm really glad to see a variety of stakeholders that are interested in, the, in this topic. That's enough from my quite long introduction uh, to you, Mr. Ubershire. Uh, please, uh, floor is yours for a, for a short welcome note. Thank you very much. 
Gentlemen, hello and it is my pleasure to warmly welcome all of you on behalf of the Friedrich Ebert Foundation for our event today. It was already mentioned um, by Lucia. My name is Oren um, Übersche and I'm responsible for our both projects in the Slovak and in the Czech Republic. I'm very happy that so many of you have accepted our invitation for this event. And I'm also very happy that we are able to win our guests um, for today's discussion. A warm welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us. Today, we would like to deal with the Digital Service Act. So the question will also be how the big power of technology corporations and platforms can be restricted. The EU Commission made proposals for this at the end of 2020 and presented a new draft law. On the one hand, this law is intended to regulate the power of tech companies. And on the other hand, it is intended to harmonize um, the digital European internal market more closely. So far, there have been many national laws that apply in addition to the e-commerce directive, depending on the EU country. For example, in Germany, the so-called Netzwerkdurchsuchungsgesetz. These different national regulations make it difficult for startups in particular to establish themselves in this market. From my point of view, however, there are very different reasons for regulating the large technology groups more closely. In my brief introduction, I would like to concentrate on one aspect in particular. I think it is undisputed that the big GAFA groups, this means Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple have a dominant position in the market in every respect. However, this is not only problematic for reasons um, of competition law. In the meantime, these corporations have a great influence on the building of public opinion and also on our democracies through their platforms. We have all known um, about the power of social networks and not just since Donald Trump. But the former US president has certainly shown us very clearly where a country can drift to if a president carries out his official duties mainly via Twitter. At the same time, we are seeing all over the world that the culture of political discussion has fundamentally changed. We experience polarization and defamation, especially in social networks. Hate speech and other bullying phenomena have increased dramatically and not just among young people. People who express themselves, themselves politically run the risk of falling victim to a virtual shitstorm. Much of what I have just described takes place in the social networks and is mainly possible because there is no real regulation. Since a form of self-regulation is not to be expected um, on the part of the corporations, the question arises how this can be achieved. And in this context, here are many questions that we may able to address in the course of our today's debate. Is the European Commission's Digital Service Act enough? What can and should be done at national level? How is the discussion going um, in the member states and especially here in Slovakia? What influence do the social networks have on the building of public opinion here? I'm really looking forward to our guests' assessments of these and um, other questions. In conclusion, let me say one more thing. This is also a very important topic for us as Friedrich Ebert Foundation. We see ourselves as a political actor and see our task in explaining political topics and in this way helping to shape citizens' opinions. One thing is essential, it has to be fair and the same rules have to apply to everyone. Otherwise, at least our democratic discussion culture is in danger. Now I wish us all an exciting event. Many thanks to our partner organization, Euraktiv. It is always a pleasure for us to work with you together. Thank you all for your attention and then it is your turn again, dear Lucia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ubushar, also for encouraging words, also for the questions that you uh, that you posed. I think uh, they are really those crucial ones for uh, for us for today's debate. Um, we will turn right away into the discussion because our time is 
now less about 80 minutes. So just, just uh, uh, I will have a lot of questions. I believe our audience will have a lot of questions uh, in order to, to answer all of that. Uh, just to make a very short introduction uh, about what we are going to talk when we are talking about Digital Services Act and Digital Markets Act. And I'm pretty sure that um, our panelists will also have their say to it, but just very general uh, to rem what, what to remember about those two legislation is that uh, legislation is that um, they got out, uh, they were proposed in December by the European Commission. Uh, the Digital Services Act, the DSA, represents basically the Europeans' ambition to regulate online services. And it's pretty much all about transparency and safety. It will cover a lot of topic um, from economy, uh, platform economy, liability for content, market dominance, advertising, um, smart contracts, online self-employment, a future governance framework. So it's really a gigantic piece of legislation, which is, I repeat, mostly oriented to transparency and to safety. The second uh, legislation that also came, uh, came out in uh, December, uh, proposed by the European Commission, and now the discussions are ongoing, are, is the Digital Markets Act, uh, or known as DMA. This, this piece shall regulate behavior of the big tech uh, companies uh, in the European single market, as Ms. Ulbushar already explained, and perhaps also beyond. Therefore, it is establishing a list of obligations that are designed to so-called gatekeepers. So the big companies, we will probably talk about them a little bit more. Um, if they will not comply, um, then there will be some uh, sanction mechanisms. Digital Markets Act, comparing to DSA, Digital Services Act, uh, is more about competition enabling. So trying to explain, trying to create such uh, environment that even smaller company can compete in, in the market that is very much influenced currently by the big tech companies. So that's my introduction. I'm not going to uh, go and I'm pretty sure I didn't explain it into enough details and there are so many hitches and glitches and, and all of this. Um, I, I don't even think that it's possible to talk in one and a half hour, uh, but we will definitely cover uh, the most important of them. Uh, Mr. Saliba, I've already mentioned that you were preparing uh, the report uh, of the European Parliament um, on the DSA. Um, it was considering uh, improvement of the functioning of the single market. Uh, this is how it's also called. And the European Parliament actually overwhelmingly backed this report. It was already in October, so before uh, we got the report uh, published from the, we got the proposal published from the European Commission. Among others, you were introducing in the report or uh, bringing up such uh, uh, mechanisms as uh, um, notice and action mechanism, um, important uh, importance of distinguishing between harmful and legal content. This is very, very crucial. So how do you evaluate the development after this publication, both the publication of your report and the publication of the Commission's proposal itself? So first of all, thanks to see you also for your uh, introductory remarks and also thanks for FES and also Euroactive for uh, organizing this very timely event. It's always my pleasure to attend and participate in the events of Euroactive and also um, FES. It's a particularly exciting time for the digital ecosystem within, within the EU and also for the push uh, of, of new novel legislation that ultimately is fit for purpose uh, in, the in the digital age. And first of all, as a rapporteur also of the Internal Market Committee, committee which basically drafted the initial reactions of the European Parliament for the two ambitious instruments that uh, the Commission published on December 15 of last year. Uh, I believe that uh, these two recommendations are a very good start, are a very good start for the discussion that we have in front of us uh, and ultimately, I think that they will start to make justice, start to make justice within a system whereby, if you tell me, please answer the question of today's event. Um, have we managed in the past 
years to tame big tech giants, I would definitely tell you no. Uh, we are very far away uh, from basically taking back control. And so I definitely welcome the um, proposals moved forward by the European Commission, both on the DSA and also the DMA, long overdue. Basically, here we were dealing with a legislation, the e-commerce directive, a 20-year-old legislation. So just imagine, 20 years ago, the European Union moved forward this legislation, which, uh, let me let me tell you from the start, I think it was uh, future-proof, because uh, as, as institutions, as member states, we were like uh, always trying to expand the definitions to basically make them fit for the new digital realities that we are living in today. But the biggest question is this, uh, is it appropriate to have a situation whereby platforms which have become the new public utilities of our time, uh, important as water and electricity, uh, people cannot live today without e-commerce, without Facebook, without Instagram, without Amazon, without Google. These platforms have become integral parts of our, of our life. And the majority of these platforms were or at their very initial stages 20 years ago, or they didn't even exist 20 years ago. And we are still trying to regulate the ecosystem, how they function, basically regulate their behavior with a legislation that came into being before, in fact, they were they, they came into existence. So um, long overdue to have this reform to have this set of rules that will definitely be indispensable for our, for our lives. And I believe um, it will bring forward big change, not only in the digital single market within the European Union, but definitely as we had with the general data protection regulation, it will definitely affect other continents and other regions. So we have a good opportunity and we have to make the most uh, out of this opportunity we can't go wrong uh, with the with the with the initiatives that we are moving forward with the solutions that we are moving forward so we fill in those legal gaps uh, that we have so ultimately going back to your question people could finally take back control of the digital world which is of fundamental importance and these two pieces of legislation um, must create a new legal framework regulating digital services, including online platforms and also marketplaces, marketplaces which have become so important in our time. And unfortunately, we are in a situation whereby we have very complex rules when it comes to our businesses, our startups physically, who have to, who want to basic, basically make the most out of the single market to market their products so that their products and services can move freely within the, within the union. But ultimately we have this, I like to call it competitive disadvantage, whereby there is this set of rules, technical harmonization, really important to protect the health and safety of our consumers. But again, which is also putting a lot of burdens on our businesses, on our businesses, on our, on our SMEs. But then we have, the situation whereby third country sellers, distributors established in other continents can market directly their products, their services, which are not compliant with our technical harmonization, regulation, health and safety. Um, market directly online, enter directly in the EU market and therefore creating this competitive disadvantage. And then people will tell you, oh, but for me, it's more, it's better to buy things online from third country sellers because it is cheaper. Yes, it is cheaper. It is cheaper because um, these third country companies, sellers, uh, are not complying with health and safety regulation, which is so fundamentally important for our consumers. Therefore, apart from basically uh, these companies finding this loophole whereby they are not abiding with, with our regulations, they are also putting in danger the lives of our consumers. Therefore, ultimately, we have created a situation by not taking action during the past 20 years of creating two sets of rights. A set of rights for brick and mortar, for, on, for offline shopping, and an inferior set of rights for uh, online shopping. And there too, yes, we have to tame these big tech giants 
and also take control of online marketplaces. So we have a uniform application of rules and do away with this competitive disadvantage so that our industries, our businesses, our startups can have a fairer share, basically, to be um, also successful uh, online and also in our in our market. Okay. We have moved forward uh, as, as, as uh, an internal market committee and also as a European Parliament, a number of important principles for the DSA and the MA. For I example, think, the principle... Yes, we may get into them a little bit okay. later, so just Perfect. to... Uh, keep something for the uh, for for the later as well. Um, so you are saying we are really anticipating that uh, the legislation will we really fulfill what we expected from the beginning um, to basically make equal the offline and online environment. What is illegal offline should be illegal online as well, and vice versa. Uh, but what I'm going to uh, maybe ask a little bit, uh, just very shortly, if you could give me maybe. And three words, uh, but I am very interested about um, what is the current debate in Brussels or what are the main topics which you, from position of yeah. member of the European Parliament, consider to be really those that are maybe creating headaches here and there. Let's yes. Um, if you would tell me which of the two um, legislations and the two proposals that we have on table, which are the most hotly debated now, in the European Parliament, I would definitely tell you the DSA. There is a big discussion, for example, when it comes to transparency in online advertising and targeted advertising. This is leading also to the question of the business models of these online platforms, basically um, uh, profiling of users and using that information, mm -hmm. which no one is aware that is being collected for many different purposes, I think. Uh, advertising is one of the key debates um, that that we have, uh, and also principles such as the know your business customer principle, which is again creating a lot of noise uh, in Brussels. A principle which was of utmost importance also when when it came to um, our report in the European Parliament, which we are happy that the Commission took it on board, but we are not that happy when it comes to the level of ambition that the Commission took, when it comes to this transparency requirement, which is so important. And if you would tell me the third uh, point that you see also, that you're witnessing also a lot of discussion, I would tell you also the issue of online marketplaces, the role of online marketplaces, ultimately how we're going to um, basically uh, take back control when it comes to the way that they operate, uh, when it comes to also the basic consumer rights that they have to respect uh, in, 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 in the ecosystem. I think those are important discussions when it comes to the Digital Markets Act. Uh, here we are dealing, when it comes to the, the DMA, we're still dealing with a very ambitious proposal and I'm not going, or I'm not giving the impression that I want to take away something from the DMA. But when, when we're tackling the DMA, we're tackling issue of big tech giants, the big GAFAs, the big companies, which although there is a big discussion on the definition, I think that it is very clear uh, the pointers that, that we as legislators want basically to, to, to tackle when it comes to big tech companies. But um, there is consensus that even, I believe even amongst the players themselves, that something needs to be done because ultimately today we are living in a world where these big tech giants are dictating the rules upon which they function. Uh, everyone became aware of this phenomena, although it has been there for a number of years. For example, when we saw the US Capitol Hill incidents and we saw Parler being basically uh, struck off the system uh, by unilateral decisions taken by, by, by these big tech giants. We saw uh, a former president of the US being thrown out of the ecosystem. Uh, I'm not defending Trump and I'm not defending what he is saying because uh, I, I, I agree with not even 1% of what he says. But the big question was this, and people, citizens, the man in the street was asking these questions. Uh, on what legal basis, on what rules are these decisions being taken? 
And when you try to answer that question, you go directly into the big questions. Were we able to tame these big tech giants? So that's why the DMA was so important, so revolutionary. And I, I, I believe that there won't be so much big discussion and so much big uh, like divisions. There will be discussions on the nitty gritty, on the details, because the devil is always in the detail, but with the concept per se, of basically taking back control of big tech giants, I think that it is something that everyone accepts the fact that it is entirely needed. Thank you. We have quite a lot of detailed information. Thank you for this. It's really a knowledge coming from Brussels, which sometimes it's not really reaching us. Uh, I'm going to turn now to Warsaw and uh, to Mr. Kanomnik. Uh, Zipsy Digital Poland is, uh, as I already explained, the uh, industry employers organization is bringing together really the largest companies from the consumer electronics and um, IT operating in Poland, which uh, probably is a, a large um, industry, including manufacturers, importers, distributors. So how industry in country like Poland um, is evaluating uh, both of the proposals from your point of view? Uh, thank you very much for your question. First of all, uh, I have to say that uh, it's great to see that in Malta we have a great sun because in, in Warsaw it's snowing. So unfortunately, we have much much worse uh, weather than than in in Malta. Uh, I hope that in next few few weeks will be uh, a different situation. Uh, <clears throat> but if we are talking about the SADMA, first of all, uh, uh, in my opinion, in our opinion. Um, it's very important to uh, prepare a good regulations in uh, in this area. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, but of course, uh, it's a very complicated situation. And uh, I'm, I'm afraid that uh, in this discussion in Brussels, uh, we uh, are focused, uh, unfortunately, only um, on regulations against um, four big uh, American um, giants. Uh, and we have to think that uh, in this uh, digital um, uh, market, we have uh, much more uh, digital giants, not only American, for example, uh, Chinese companies, uh, which are more and more uh, active on the European um, market. And we have to think about, for example, uh, e-commerce uh, platforms from, uh, from China, not only about American uh, uh, tech giants um, uh, in this discussion. but. Uh, it's very important to, to listen and to, uh, to discuss about uh, these uh, two regulations in the CE region. Why? Because, you know, in my opinion, more and more um, our part of Europe become a, a real heart of digital uh, economy of, um, of Europe. Uh, we have a lot of uh, SM, um, SMEs, startups uh, in our region, uh, and uh, these companies are more and more active on uh, Europe and on or global uh, market. And uh, this digital um, part of uh, European uh, economy will be a real, uh, real engine for our region for the next uh, uh, 10, 20, 15 uh, years uh, in um, our development. So that's why it's very important to have a real uh, hot debate about the SADMA in our... And um, in Poland uh, and uh, in the whole Europe, uh, established uh, by uh, by uh, by us um, as the digital coalition in our region, we are trying to discuss about uh, these regulations and uh, what is the most important in re these regulations for our uh, region. And uh, I think that we have to find a balance between uh, um, uh, consumer rights. It's absolutely very important, but we have to find the balance between these consumer rights and business needs. Uh, because without uh, business, consumers' <laughs> uh, consumers' rights will be absolutely uh, empty, and we have to um, uh, take care about this this balance in all, all um, European uh, regulations. I, I'm afraid that uh, uh, European Commission in uh, DSA DMA uh, is very close to the similar mistake than in many many regulations uh, in history. It's trying to overregulate. Um, this uh, digital market and digital market, digital economy hates overregulating, and we have to uh, think about it and uh, take care about this regulation to avoid this uh, over overregulate in this um, area. We have to remember that uh, DSA DMA is uh, not only regulations against 
uh, tech giants, but it should be, it must be uh, regulations for SMEs and startups. We have to create regulations which will be uh, very useful and helpful for SMEs, for um, uh, startups in Europe to create uh, new businesses, new services, new products in the European and the global uh, market. Without uh, this, this will be empty regulations and uh, <clears throat> We have to think about uh, about something else. And uh, last sentence um, be, uh, be before our uh, uh, debate, we have to uh, think. We have to remember that uh, in our part of Europe, it's very important to have a lot of investment in uh, in new technologies, and uh, to create a new business, new services, new uh, products in our small uh, companies. We have to take care about investments in R and D centers in our uh, part of Europe, uh, Europe. We have a lot of um, R&D centers, for example, in Poland, uh, in Slovakia, and we have to take care to create a very good regulation for these companies uh, to establish a new uh, investment uh, project uh, in our part of Europe, to create cooperations between our SMEs, our startups and big uh, tech giants to create um, a new uh, digital uh, market in, uh, in whole Europe. Yes, very valid point, especially about the consumers' rights versus uh, business needs balance. I think that's very uh, crucial, and Mr. Salva also mentioned it. I would like to uh, ask the consumption that, yes, you don't want the legislation to overregulate the whole environment, but could you be a little bit more specific when we talk about overregulation? Which parts do you find going really beyond of what maybe your... Uh, industry or, or industry that you represent uh, needs? Well, uh, in, in this discussion, we, um, uh, we uh, find a few uh, doubts in this uh, DSA DMA. Maybe in exactly five, five sentences, I will, uh, I will summary uh, our, our doubts in this um, area. So first, contrary to the regulations goal, introduction of a new law may lead to a burden um, in costly legal services and diversity of for consumers. This SMEs, um, excuse me, um, uh, costly legal management only affordable by the largest players. It's very risky for our part of Europe to avoid regulations would be uh, too much costly for, um, for uh, SMEs. Any duties introduced must be possible to be handled by SMEs. We are afraid that in this uh, project, in DMA and DSA, we, ha we have uh, possibilities to create a, a new um, uh, legal um, um, uh, cost will be too much for uh, SMEs. Uh, secondly, while developing regulations, it's necessary to keep in mind the role of and capabilities of small and medium enterprises in fueling innovation. It's very important. We have to think about innovation uh, in the European uh, economy, not only about uh, about regulations for uh, tech giants. Indirectly, regulations may lead to growing costs of legal adjustment. I, I mentioned about it. This could result in driving investments currently located in the countries of CE uh, outside of EU. It's very, very uh, dangerous for our uh, part of Europe, as well as making cooperation with uh, non-EU entities uh, harder. The industry hopes that the regulations will not indirectly push non-EU investments out of the sea uh, region. And uh, the uh, last two um, doubts, the, the industry in the sea region also expects legislation fair across the whole EU. Uh, depending on the integration, a true digital single market should provide companies competing in, the, in, in it with equal opportunities, despite of um, uh, their place of origin. Um, and the last um, but not least, regulations uh, which put the rising export-oriented, uh, less diversified economies of Europe at risk of harm must be avoided. Uh, rights and obligations resulting from the new regulations of the Act should be uh, of an universal nature. Uh, uniformly affecting all of the, of the economies across um, EU. I'm afraid that the um, European Commission uh, is trying to, um, to create regulation for creating a new uh, European um, digital companies to support these uh, digital companies in Europe. But the uh, Commission forgot that we, we lost this chance for a real digital um, uh, companies in Europe many years ago. And nowadays we have to think about 
partnership between uh, the global in global market between Europe and the United States, maybe Asia, some companies from Asia, uh, to cooperate and be a partner in this global uh, discussion about digital market. Uh, but because, in my opinion, only by regulations, ro low regulations, we are, it's impossible to create a new digital giants from, uh, from Europe. And from scratch in, in some cases. I think very, very valid point and also covering uh, Slovakia, I think uh, you together with um, Slovak organizations were publishing a paper on it uh, and, and those uh, recommendations and also um, kind of uh, remarks uh, were, were uh, vocalized over there. Uh, we will definitely get back to some of them that you uh, that you mentioned, especially I'm interested in costs uh, for, for smaller uh, companies. Uh, and now let's uh, return back to Bratislava and to Mr. Kuklish. Um, you are the head of uh, the Council for Broadcasting and uh, Retransmission, which um, 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 I already announced. Uh, so it's a little bit different part of the industry uh, that uh, we so far talked about, but it's very much related to the legislation. So how do you evaluate uh, the proposal from the point of view of broadcasters, from uh, from maybe media, um, and how also do you evaluate the debate that followed after the publishing, maybe more in Slovakia? So thank you very much once again for inviting me here. I'm also you know, working very closely with ERGA, the European Group for Regulatory Group for Audiovisual Media Services, and we are advising uh, the Commission, and we were advising them around you know topics uh, in the DSA. And of course, uh, one other initiative that should be mentioned here, I think, is, is, is European uh, Action Plan, uh, Democracy Action Plan, is actually addressing you know different parts of, of the problem that we currently have with big tech like disinformation and and uh, problems with media plurality and protection of journalists and and media as such, for example. So I think you no, know, now we're really having the, the the moment in Europe where we are trying to holistically uh, address. Uh, the problems that are stemming from from these big digital platforms, you know, uh, being really strong in the digital environment here in Europe. But this discussion is also in the US currently. So I think, you know, it is really important that what we, you know, when we find some solutions, uh, they very probably will influence also others. Now we have a, a, a bit of a, a for more fortunate situation that we don't have section 230 of the of the Communication Decency Act as, as now is the big thing in the US that is really uh, you know, limiting the liability of the big platforms, you know, that they are, they are not liable for anything that is happening on their platforms. Uh, we have a kind of limited liability where we are still, uh, you know, allowing for uh, you know, legally addressing the illegal content on the platforms and we can build on that and now the DSA is doing precisely that. And I think uh, the first thing we have to talk about, and it's been already mentioned here, but I think the first thing we need to talk about when we want to address the problems of the big platforms is transparency. Now we currently have really problem understanding what is happening online. You know, we don't see what the algorithms are doing. We don't see the, who is the make, who is making the decisions uh, for the content on the platforms, and you know, the platforms don't have obligation to do anything about it to to make those processes transparent. They are making some transparent transparency reports, which is much better than it was in a few years ago. But still, we still uh, don't know whether the the the, uh, the information there are actually accurate. And of course, we see many aggregated kind of uh, data and information. But if you want to understand what is particularly uh, happening in the EU or even on the member state level, that is extremely hard. And I think very good thing that the DSA is doing is putting this transparency obligation. Uh, there. But there are also, you know, some, some things that may be still improved, although I think both of the documents, DMA and DSA, are, you know, qualifies great, you know, uh, you know, background documents for this uh, legislative process. There is really a very strong foundation for this legislative debate. But I think, you know, we need to talk about, you know, the, the improvements that can be made there. And I think in terms of, very, in terms of uh, transparency, you know, it is a need of verification of, of the data that the, that the platforms are, are giving to the regulators or even to the public. And in, on that point, I think that there can be, you know, some improvements made there. I think if we are thinking about some kind of public verification or public authority that can verify the data and then hand it over to the regulators, 
that can then do the regulatory thing, for example, it might be a big improvement in that. It is also what is also needed, I think, in addressing of illegal content. You know, we have a kind of mechanism calling uh, that is called uh, notice and takedown or sometimes no notice and action. I think, and many people were hoping for that DSA would already, you know, do it in, in, the, in the proposal is to harmonize these processes and also make them more transparent, for example, because many states have those systems, but they are not transparent enough. You know, nobody knows, you know, who is, who is sending those notices to the platforms, for example. Users don't understand how these mechanisms work. And I think it might be really helpful uh, for the legal certainty uh, of both users and platforms if these things were harmonized. And if we have a robust mechanism that can that that then can be enforced vis-a-vis -vis the platforms, and this is also a problem of smaller countries vis-a-vis -vis the bigger countries. You know, in in big markets, you know, it really suffices if you know a state authority sends a notice to the platform, and if the platform don't want to have any problems with that, you know, state authority, they would just take down the the the, the content. This is not happening with smaller countries, you know. Uh, there is not that much of a, of a deference to, to these notices from smaller countries. So I think to harmonize this, that all the countries would have the same approach to that and also the same transparency then, you know, to understand what is happening might be definitely helpful. And good thing is that, that the DSA is also introducing a kind of regulatory scheme. Downside of this is that the scheme is quite complicated. If, if you think about it, we are also we are already uh, always talking about efficiency of the regulatory approach. But if you if you think about how the DSA is approaching this, it doesn't seem to be that efficient. So I think to streamline these processes might be a, a very good idea. And then good thing in the DSA is that it's calling for really independent regulators to to be in charge of this on the member state level. The bad thing is that on the EU state in EU level. It is the commission itself that it is that is the, the real regulator there. And I think also on that level, we need independent kind of approach. So I think that there, there should be a stronger push to a kind of independent oversight on the EU level uh, on these processes. Mm -hmm. uh, just uh, if I can uh, just two, two follow up questions uh, related to this. Uh, firstly, uh, could you explain how this mechanism could work in Slovakia, for instance, if there would be a notice sent, who would be sending it, uh, particularly in Slovakia, which, which will be the authority. And second, could you also evaluate the debate around uh, the DSA DMA in Slovakia? Because we know it was um, very marginal. Uh, currently, I think Ministry of, uh, Ministry of Industry, uh, Ministry of Economy opened a public discussion on the two proposals. Um, do, do you have some more details on this? Uh, Indeed, uh, first thing, well, the notice and takedown is probably happening in Slovakia, but as we don't have any, you know, uh, real legal procedures, it is probably happening, you know, from, you know, state authority to state authority, when they see something illegal, they will probably send it to the, uh, to, to the platforms, but I don't think we have any kind of legal, legal mechanism for that. We, for, for that purpose, we are already uh, uh, negotiating or we are debating this with the Ministry of Culture, because now we while working on a new media law. And for example, in there, there should be some kind of obligations toward the platforms. And one of that uh, that we are currently discussing is to have a real meaningful notice and takedown uh, procedure. For example, it, it, you know, the approaches can be you know, several. It's, it's not that you know, it's only one way to do that. But for example, if we take uh, a user that is, you know, complaining to the to the platform, and is and, and he thinks that the content that he would like to take down is concerning him, for example, and is illegal, and platforms are, are not doing anything, and this is this is quite often this is something that is quite often happening in, in our region, then you can go to regulate and say, okay, I apply this to the platform, to the platform. they are not doing anything, and then the the, the regulator can start a procedure. Uh, ideally, very quick one. You know, where it can the regulator can consider whether this is indeed illegal content. If yes, they will send a take notice and take down uh, a decision or you know what, whatever we will call it to the platform. And then you have a. This is something that's already you know you can already do do that you know via e-commerce directive. This is something that DSA also anticipate. So this is something that we already have some background for that. But we need to 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 do a a, a real procedure there, and one that will be you know, transparent, that, you know, everybody can then read why this notice was sent uh, to the platform and what's been done with it. 
because this is this is an important part of that. So this is the first of your question. Now the second, what is currently happening here? Indeed, it is the Ministry of Com Commerce who is in charge of uh, kind of these debates and and kind of implementation of the of the DSA and uh, DMA. Uh, here, although it will be uh, a regulation, very probably. So, as a form of you know, it means that as a as a uh, legislative instrument, it is uh, you know when it is enforced, you don't have to implement it. It's, it is binding, you know, by itself. So it is not like a normal uh, directive, you know, where, where you have some kind of time, one year, two years, to implement it. This is go. This this is enforced. In the, in the member state without implementation. But we have already discussions around this because of course there are many things that the member state would need to address uh, because of the DSA DMA regulation. And we are in debates. It is not only Ministry of Commerce, it is also Ministry of Informatization, for example, Ministry of Culture. So, so there are, you know, it is quite a robust debate. And I think this is, this is very fortunate because we've, we've been calling for this, you know, even before the DSA uh, was on the table because that's the problem you know, honestly, in Slovakia, sometimes that we are debating things when it, you know, for very late in the season. So now, hopefully, this is not happening, and we already are addressing, you know, the major questions there. For example, the regulatory structure, how it might look like, and so on. So, so hopefully, we will be prepared once once we know the final outcome. Thank you. Yes. Well, if I if I can uh, add two, please two, yes. two, two sentences because it's very <clears throat> interesting what you uh, what you said. And I would like to add um, uh, two comments to, uh, uh, to two issues. First of all, um, this, uh, this last um, last thing, it's, it's very important, it's very complicated in general, I think, in Poland uh, especially, for example, that uh, the DSA DMA, DMA it's a, a law um, somewhere between uh, um, uh, Minister of Culture, Minister of Digital Affairs and Minister of Development. It's very complicated in uh, almost every European countries to find the balance between uh, this point of view uh, of this free, uh, free part of uh, every uh, government. So it's very important to find some way to, um, uh, to consult, uh, to, to discuss in, in every country about these, uh, these regulations and this find this, the best, um, the best uh, solutions between this free uh, part of uh, economy. But uh, what you said about uh, notice and takedown, it's very important, I think, in my opinion, in Poland, we have very good experiences uh, around notice and uh, takedown, and uh, it's very it's, it's, it's very good uh, solutions uh, in, uh, in Polish uh, opinion. Uh, and I think that we should uh, find these best practices uh, from many countries uh, in this area and find the best solutions for whole, uh, whole Europe. If we have some platforms uh, in Europe which um, uh, are, not, are doing nothing uh, about, uh, um, about uh, um, uh, folks and intellectual rights, we have to take care about this platform, but uh, we have to use uh, solutions which we have on the market and um, we have to use these best, best practices. Because if we uh, create uh, in these new regulations, um, uh, this I, I mentioned, over-regulate this, uh, this issue, uh, for example, by some, <clears throat> Excuse me. Some um, uh, AI mechanism to find uh, this, uh, this, uh, this um, uh, um, in social media or in general in the internet some uh, some sentences from uh, from customer which we have to um, take down, but not notice and take down, but uh, by uh, by uh, automatically. It's very risky because we have to take, uh, think about uh, freedom of speech, freedom of. Uh, uh, of uh, of uh, uh, not due to um, uh, access to information, and we have to find the balance between digital security uh, and the freedom of, of data flow. It's very complicated, but it's a very very delicate um, uh, issue. And I think that the European Parliament and the European Commission uh, have really really a very very um, uh, big problem to find this balance. But uh, exactly, you have to find this balance. Uh, we, as an industry, we can help you and show you the best practices uh, for our market, how to uh, do it uh, to avoid uh, these, uh, these, these problems with, uh, for example, uh, freedom. But um, I'm afraid that the uh, European Commission is going to, uh, uh, to find uh, new regulations, uh, but without, um, uh, without uh, checking uh, the best practices uh, from different European markets. There are definitely the thing, thank you for bringing this up. There are definitely these uh, these kind of question marks where we are going to draw a line 
uh, on, on those matters. Uh, there is, as you mentioned, freedom of speech, freedom of reach. Uh, there is the division between uh, business secret and the transparency that we are going to have. And all of that probably are going to have a certain uh, lining where it is divided. And this is going to be a very hard job for the European Commission, European Parliament and European Council as well, eventually, um, industry will be giving inputs, as, as you said. So, Mr. Saliba, how, how do you expect this balance to really occur? Because I am afraid that, or from the previous experiences or, or what we've seen in such majestic legislations, that these lines, uh, the, the debates will turn very philosophical, first of all, uh, up going to the values. Uh, and, and secondly, yeah, some, some people will be very disappointed. Some people might be even very happy. Um, if I may also make a reference to what Mikhail has just stated on the notice and action system. Because this was, I had a whole year of meetings with different stakeholders leading up to the proposals that uh, we, came, uh, we came by in the European Parliament that we voted in the plenary last year, end of last year. And if I may say, there are so many different elements when you are speaking about the DSA, from uh, online marketplaces, advertising, to, 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 to issues of transparency, you know, your business customer, AI, data retention, a lot of issues. But I think that, and there were a lot of different opinions from different stakeholders and I was, we were also discussing this a year ago in a Euroactive event being, this, being organized in Brussels, that the biggest issue that we were seeing in the beginning of these discussions was this, that there were divisions not only between different stakeholders, different players intermediating at different levels in the ecosystem, but there were also differences and divergences also in stakeholders representing the same sector, but under different umbrellas. But if there was one element in the DSA that I believe that there was, um, there was a common approach and everyone was agreeing that we should that we must take it was the issue of notice uh, and action. Um, so, uh, and I'm being very clear on this, notice and action, not notice, action and stay down. Because this was, when you're hinging and I'm very aware and fundamental rights are of fundamental importance when we are speaking of the ecosystem and on this legislation. And Article 15, the ban on general monitoring, the examples that were being directly referred to by uh, Mikhail, uh, whereby you look uh, into, into the online content and try to find that content and take it down this AI uh, discussion of like having online robots to, to, to monitor what is going on online to take down this content. That is general monitoring. So you are looking at all the content to take particular actions. That is still uh, not permissible. And the parliament and also the council were clear from the very start of these discussions that this should not be the way forward. So Article 15, ban on general monitoring, was there under the e-commerce directive, will stay intact under the DSA. So there is no discussion about that. But one of the biggest worries of industries uh, and of players was the, uh, first of all, fragmentation that we have in the 27 EU member states. So what is this fragmentation? We have the Nets DG in Germany, the initiative, uh, being undertaken in France, different initiatives, all tackling the issues of notice and action by very different means. So if you want to make the utmost of the digital single market and you want to basically be present in different markets online, you have to have all the resources, all the resources in the world, even if you're a startup, even if you're a small company, an army of lawyers, basically, to be able to comply with different standards, with different regulations being undertaken in different member states. And this was creating a lot of confusion. A lot of confusion because it is practically impossible to be able to comply with 27, imagine, 27 different notice and action systems. Some member states have, 
Some member states are contemplating, some have drafts and discussions are going on. So this was uh, an issue which, not, which was not feasible to be undertaken. This is the first, first point. And at the same time, this was creating a lot of uncertainty for the business because for the players themselves intermediating, because ultimately, uh, how can you go about uh, 27 different systems working in tandem? And what was our scope? Our scope was to have a horizontal um, piece of legislation. Uh, you have the lex specialis of, of, of notice and action being applicable for specific sectors such as child abuse of material, terrorist content, we have specific legislation dealing with those areas uh, and, and it won't be affected by the general notice and action system. But ultimately here, what we are, what we are moving forward is a step-by-step, -step, not too bureaucratic, um, not, not too um, difficult to implement. But at the same time, if we want to create this level playing field between the online and offline, what was, and I'm coming to your discussion, to your question now, um, are we going overboard with, with, with this regulation? Uh, are we going in the direction of creating this big, uh, big discussion, big controversy as we did with the copyright directive and everyone was killing each other in parliament? Um, uh, it's, 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 it's not this thing. But at the same time, I think that a certain level of legislation and regulation is needed not to overregulate. But at the same time, we need to do something. If we leave everything as is, if we leave everyone to self-regulate themselves, we can never tame this, these big tech giants. They have created an, an ecosystem of their own upon which they interact, upon which they are determining uh, our, our uh, choices, our commercial choices, our political choices. We have seen big scandals which has rocked our democracies to the very core. WikiLeaks, uh, the, um, the issue of, 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 of Cambridge Analytica, sorry, issues of data collection, how this data is being used, algorithms, how they are being used to target particularly users to influence their opinion, to influence our democracies. The most sacred, fundamental element of our societies. So by using the argumentation that okay, let's be wary not to regulate, not to do anything because we can stifle innovation, because we can stifle competition. I would tackle this argumentation from the opposite side. With the lesser fair attitude that we took, with the self-regulation that we took, the smallest fry in the game, the startups, the smaller companies, which wanted and have all the potential uh, in the world to be able to compete there because they have the know-how and they have the, 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 the tools to do so. They were hindered to do this because of the uncompetitive behavior that ultimately was uh, and is still um, dominating the ecosystem. So if we want scale-ups, if we want basically to compete with Silicon Valley companies, big tech companies, ultimately we have to have regulation whereby we can give the same opportunity to these companies to be competitive online. If we fail to do this, we would remain in this situation without European champions in the field. Just very concrete question back to, to the notice and action. Um, I think that uh, the fact that we need the regulation, that even industry requires it, that the customers require it, that's um, I think we can all, all, all agree to this. Uh, the, the extent, of course, is in debate. Uh, I'm going back to this uh, notice and action because it's going to have an effect also perhaps on the uh, freedom of speech. Um, how, uh, in your opinion, should this look in practice? I, as a user, am going to the social network, seeing a um, certain content. How, who, who's going to be the one reaching the company? how this whole procedure should be working out in a way that, let's say, European Parliament would be uh, happy about that. Yes, um, if you look at the proposal that we have moved forward, and I think that the Commission took the majority of, of, of our proposals, of the proposals of the European Parliament, proposals that were featuring, in my opinion, in my report, but also in Timo Volkanen's report, who was the reporter in the EU Committee on DSA, 
which were focusing more on civil and, co and contractual law. And they were focusing more on this notice and action, and action system. Basically, we moved forward a step-by-step -step system whereby um, basically we were moving on uh, a number of, of, of requirements from when content is basically flagged and um, time frames and what kind of actions and transparency of the of the of what is going on ultimately what decisions are these players taking for example so we have a situation today whereby there is total uh, invisibility of these decisions of takedowns for example that are being undertaken by these companies okay you have big tech companies which annually out of their own free will they may be publishing some uh, the tip of the iceberg of the information and actions that they are taking. But ultimately, with the requirements that we are moving forward, we, are, we want to give our users the peace of mind that the actions uh, and takedowns, and here we are dealing with content free, free speech, ultimately, that, is, that can be taken down. Ultimately, we give um, our users, our citizens, the peace of mind that the actions that are being taken by these platforms, not only big tech giants, but all the platforms, because here yeah, the notice and action system is not being implemented under the DMA for specific systemic operators, but it is being applicable across the board for all the players. Um, ultimately, it would lead to a situation whereby there is the peace of mind, and this is the priority of the parliament in this regard, that there is more transparency that we look under the hood, that all the actions that are being taken are being taken not solely by self-regulation upon a number of ethics and code of conduct of the particular platforms, but are being taken by a set of rules, um, not, again, not uh, too burdensome on the, on, the, on the industries, on the small industries, but at the same time, a set of rules which can give more transparency of what decisions are being taken, how they are being taken, and that they are being taken in accordance to legislation. Yes, I understand. And I will go uh, now with kind of developing uh, to this from consumers to industry, because Mr. Kanovnik, you already uh, mentioned that, yes, it may come hand to hand with uh, raising uh, certain costs, either legal or implying certain tools in order uh, to uh, fulfill those obligations. Um, I, my question is whether the implementation of, of or I will ask differently whether um, how much how, how big will be that cost for uh, small and medium com uh, companies um, to fulfill the mentioned obligation not only notice in action but maybe maybe even others and whether it may be further translated back to users as it usually gets either in terms of uh, advertisement or me as and, and my data being a product basically that is sold is suddenly going to be more expensive. So maybe some other companies who would like to advertise or do something online, reach me, uh, this will be more expensive for them. Are you anticipating something like this or, or what is uh, the debate regarding the costs? Mr. Kanovnik, yes. Uh, excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> of course, it's it's very it's very uh, complicated to um, you know, to find out how much uh, uh, will be cost this these regulations for SMEs. But uh, we are trying to uh, to make some uh, analysis in this area. But we have to remember about one more thing, uh, in my opinion, if we are talking about uh, costs for SMEs. It's because uh, from the one hand, it's a um, uh, direct cost from this regulation for SMEs. Um, uh, to create a new uh, legal department, a new uh, new um, new technological um, uh, engines for some 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 SMEs will be necessary to um, uh, to avoid some uh, some legal problems uh, on the market. But uh, um, second thing, and maybe in some areas uh, much more um, important is um, uh, non-direct costs for uh, SMEs um, in Europe because of this regulation. Because many of uh, SMEs, uh, many of startups in, uh, in Europe are using uh, different um, services, uh, different uh, products of these uh, technical giants from uh, United States 
to create their own uh, business, their own uh, e-commerce, for example, in uh, in Europe. And what about uh, this situation that uh, these products will be too uh, costly for um, for SMEs to use these um, uh, these products on the European market because uh, tech giants from the United States will have to uh, find some uh, some way to uh, to get more much more money. From the Uber market um, to uh, to pay for new uh, regulations, it, this is uh, I think uh, much more risky for SMEs than uh, the direct cost. Of course, it's very 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 risky, but I think that this uh, this uh, potential barrier for SMEs uh, to get uh, some um, uh, services, some products from uh, Google or Facebook or or Amazon uh, to create their own businesses, their, their own uh, uh, product to reach uh, to uh, new customers uh, is very, very risky. And please remember about these consumer rights. One more thing about this one, because we have to create these regulations uh, and avoid situation that uh, um, this new law uh, from DSA or DMA will be a barrier for creating a new services for consumers. Because if, uh, for example, one of the uh, big platforms um, will be, uh, it's, it will be impossible uh, based on new DSA or DMA uh, act, create, for example, uh, a combined uh, services uh, in uh, touristic, for example, uh, services to, uh, to uh, give me a service uh, together, um, a booking of uh, hotel, uh, plane, uh, car, um, tickets for museum in one, uh, in one uh, application in my, my phone. Uh, based on uh, these projects, it will be complicated. Is it possible to, uh, to offer me this uh, combined uh, service in uh, in your uh, app? Uh, so uh, uh, for me, it's interesting. Do you do you uh, have some analysis in, in the parliament? How uh, how will be um, uh, about costs for SMEs and what about uh, uh, about consumers um, and these services, uh, which will be much more complicated to offer these combined services for uh, consumers. It's uh, about this, your question about money and the costs for SMEs. I'm afraid that it's rather a, a, a question for the Commission. Um, do they know <laughs> what about this cost for SMEs uh, uh, in this, in these regulations? We are, we are, we are preparing this, uh, this analysis and uh, I ho hope that in the next um, two or three weeks uh, we'll be able to, uh, to share with you uh, our um, our analysis in this uh, area. Of course, I will send you, and uh, of course, I will send you to, to Brussels, um, uh, and uh, it will be uh, maybe a good uh, point to to the uh, new, new new kind of discussion about mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, these regulations. I am going to uh, a little bit move because uh, we do not have that much time, and I think we would need at least two more hours to really get deep into everything what we want to say. Uh, there is one question for, I think Mr. Kanami can uh, reply, it will be just very quick. Uh, we we mentioned that DMA is going to mostly focusing on tackling the big giants. The question here uh, that we have from the audience is who's going to tackle uh, small social media platforms actually. Um, that's DSA, who's going to be uh, regulating that? Or maybe Mr. Um, yes, if I may, um, yeah. when we are dealing with the DSA, here we are not dealing with size, so it will it will be applicable to all players. The issue with the DMA, the DMA will be tackling only those big tech players, which we uh, catch under the definition of having a systemic role and a gatekeeper role, basically having this uncompetitive um, function which cannot be tackled by EU traditional competition law by itself, the uh, ex, ex, ex post measures. Uh, so we are creating this ex ante measures, a system which basically is preventing problems from ultimately happening. So preempting uh, these uncompetitive practices that dominate the ecosystem. But when we're touching the DMA, the notice and action, the issues of transparency and advertisement, the issues regulating and creating a special liability regime for online marketplaces, know your business customer, whereby we are increasing transparency so that EU, EU services could not be used 
by anonymous uh, commercial commercial entities so that they can directly infringe uh, our 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 legislations uh, from copyright to to inferior quality products to intellectual property rights you named so these um, requirements under the DSA will be applicable to everyone um, and ultimately uh, will not distinguish between big and small players. So they will be tackled there. Good. Uh, another question which we have, and it's, I think, uh, more related, or Mr. Kuklish could uh, respond to this. Um, I will kind of uh, contextualize it. Um, uh, there are some news about German media regulators who just got the power to oversee tech companies in some way. Um, they are telling, very <laughs> simplified, uh, to the commission that the DSA doesn't take into account media regulation enough. Uh, their statements on DSA draft uh, actually says that uh, commission, you should look uh, you should look at what we are doing here in Germany. We kind of figured it out, come and, and check it out. And we have uh, also this remark from Mr. Andrei uh, Skokai, uh, who is saying that uh, he, his organization, or um, he didn't specify, they collected uh, lawyers' opinions from five countries uh, on probably similar to that uh, matter, uh, which will be soon published. Uh, issues are concerning imminent threat, advantages and disadvantages of national regulators, comparison of German DSA and a European DSA. Uh, could you, I don't know if you're familiar with, with that uh, topic, but could you maybe or explain to, to us as well uh, what, we, what is the discussion about? I'll try. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, I, I would like to just add to what uh, Mr. Saliba said about, you know, the, the, the scope of the DSA. I think it has to be also said that, you know, the approach is graduated. So, for example, the, 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 the most onerous obligations are going to do very large online platforms, which, you know, are the, really the, the big players there. So it's not that all the obligations are for everyone. There's also distinction between, you know, uh, companies that are hosting uh, uh, content, you know, which are, you know, intermediaries in, in terms of platform or which are, you know, only technical in uh, cash uh, kind of meaning. So I think th this graduated thing is, is very important in, in, in the DSA. And this is something uh, that is really important also debates outside of the EU, because I already in the US, you know, the debate is, you know, how to, how to, you know, regulate, but not to hinder the innovation. And this approach, you know, is, is, is a meaningful thing to do uh, in, in this regard. Now, into your question, well, if this is referring to NetDG, German uh, German law on uh, hate speech on, on, on networks, you know, this is something that DSA is also, you know, addressing because DSA as an idea, you know, came or were, were you know, probably uh, very much, you know. Uh, pushed by, by uh, the member states saying that we will have our own leg legislation against you know, platforms. And SDG was first of these laws. And it is, it is a law that is addressing hate speech. And it is asking the platforms to take down hate speech uh, in a very short uh, period. You know, it's, it's, it's 24 hours. Uh, then, you know, with some instances, seven days. And then, you know, there are quite big uh, 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 fines uh, you know, written in the law if, if the platforms are not doing this. Now, important thing here is that this kind of approach is systematic, so to say. So they are asking the platforms to have a measures in place, you know, and then they are controlling how these measures work. So the fine is not, you know, uh, would, would not be sanctioned, the platform would, be, would not be sanctioned if one instance of hate speech is still on the platform not taken down in 24 hours. But if this is not working systematically, you know, then uh, the SDG uh, will make it possible to to, uh, to 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 find a platform. Now there are concerns with this. For example, there is no kind of a redress for the user whose content was was taken down because of SDG, and uh, the the authority which is overseeing this is part of Ministry of Justice, I think, which is which is not you know it's not an independent regulator, for example. And these things, you know, are, are now tried to be addressed by DSA to some some extent. Now we have to also think about DSA because DSA is really horizontal kind of legislation, so it does you no, know, it, it doesn't go deeply into into various areas. 
And this is also something that our German colleagues are calling for, you know, to, to have the media regulation, you know, more deeply entrenched into the DSA. Now, the answer by the Commission is this is a horizontal kind of law or horizontal legislation, which means that we are addressing e-commerce, you know, meaning markets, uh, electronic markets, as well as some kind of content, you know, but this is not a sectorial regulation, for example, as a directive of the, on, on the audiovisual media services, which is, you know, addressing the media in a you know, deep way because this is a sectorial kind of legislation. Now, my answer would be, okay, I understand that this is horizontal kind of legislation, but is the commission already thinking about some kind of sectoral uh, legislation that can come afterwards, for example, because of media or, for example, because of disinformation problem. Way uh, that is sub-regulatory. It was you know, pushed by the commission uh, very intensely, but still it's a sub-regulation. Now the DSA, for example, is addressing a, pro a problem of disinformation very lightly, it is addressing it via codes of conduct, which again should be kind of kind of several regulation. And I think what we can do, if, if either we have a sectoral legislation just after the ESA, or we can probably change these things a bit more. For example, to go for a meaningful kind of co-regulation where the platforms are doing their own thing, their own measures, you know, addressing many, so to say, harmful, you know, content, for example, like disinformation, but also protection of children and things like that. And then there can be a kind of regulatory uh, follow up to that, you know, to see how these measures are actually uh, working, whether they are, you know, fulfilling the intent that, it, that they should. And then, you know, if it's not working well, then you can have a really meaningful regulatory action. DSA and the DSA, and I think this is probably from the point of media what the German media regulators are referring to. So, where do you anticipate that this uh, line that I was mentioning before between freedom of speech and, and freedom of breach is going to be drawn by that legislation, in your opinion? Well, I think the important thing is that there, there's a distinction between illegal content and harmful content. Now, it was a big debate even before the DSA. Now, what the DSA is doing is allowing the member states to deal with illegal content in a really, you know, obligatory way for the platforms. So, for example, when we are talking, and this is probably also the distinction we have to make when we are talking about notice and takedown or notice and action uh, mechanisms, because, you know, one of those mechanisms is complaints by the users. You know, you just click something, you flag something on the platforms and to follow up what the, what the platforms are doing. The other notice and take down notice and action mechanism is when the member state, member state authority, you know, it, it may be court, but it may be regulatory authority, is asking the platform to do something about illegal content. The first one is going under the umbrella of community standards of the platforms. And if they are, if, if they deem, you know, that this is not uh, breaching uh, our, our community standards, then it's okay. Now, the second one is, is, a, content, is, is a question of legality and illegality. And if the member state says that this is illegal, you know, the, 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 the platform really should comply with that. So these are two different kind of mechanisms there. And uh, but I lost my, my line here or line of thought here. Uh, what was the question, question was again, please? Uh, where, where will be that line between freedom of speech and freedom yes. of speech? Yes, thank yeah. you, thank you. Sorry for that. Uh, so now the important thing is, that for, for the harmful content, you know, in that part, we are dealing or looking at the approach that is systematic. It is not, you know, we are not talking about addressing every single item of content on the platform, for example. We are asking with the DSA, we are asking the platforms to, to, to put measures that will deal uh, with the, the most, you know, problematic content there. We are asking them to, to have a risk assessment of their own, you know, what is happening on their platforms. And then we are asking them to make that information available to regulators and others. This is this this is one thing. So it's it's not that you are you know pushing the platforms to take down content or something, just to understand what is happening there, and to have measures in place that will really stop you know the most problematic thing there. And that's what I meant by illegality. You know, still there is a possibility if something illegal is happening there, the states can you know take action. And this is really even in the DSA, this is left to member states to, to do in their own right, so to say.
But I'm, what I'm saying, and I said that uh, for, in my initial comments, I think the important thing probably here is also to harmonize this, to have a certain requirements for these notices and take that action by, by, by the member states, you know, uh, to, to really understand the reasoning for why some content is deemed by the that state or authority as illegal and be really transparent about that to both users and the platforms. Yeah. Um, so um, just to maybe wrap up to what we've already been through and uh, have maybe like probably a last round of uh, questions. Uh, the two legislations, I, I don't uh, we, we can all agree that the, the um, regulations themselves are needed. Industry is asking it, consumers are asking it, states and reg regulators are asking for it. Um, it's going to happen. We cannot have a fragmented market. This is the last, the least thing that anybody wants to, to either do business or either to, to do anything digital uh, on the European market. There are many outstanding questions, uh, most of them related to transparency, how far can the companies go and show us what is business secret, what is not anymore, what can we see, how they are working. Uh, second big question is who and how is going to regulate um, certain measures that are taken by those uh, companies. We talked about the notice and action, who is going to do it, how they are going to do it, how we are discussing um, currently uh, all those um, measurements that are going to come, which tools do we have. We also, especially the industry uh, is pointing to the fact that we really need uh, to um, pick up with investment, not only for the small and medium enterprises, but also in certain parts of Europe probably in different way than in other. It co goes hand in hand with infrastructure and so on, uh, research and development support for uh, smaller, uh, uh, make them available to raise up and also create partnerships, not only to create something new out of nothing, but um, create ways of cooperations. Uh, but what's going to come now? So we know that the, the uh, regulation is going to be both, both legislations are going to be discussed in upcoming months. It's probably not going to uh, come together, not this year, probably not even next year. Uh, so just to kind of uh, finish with some, uh, some outlook for the future, my question to all three of you would be, what are your expectations of upcoming months? Where will be the uh, debate heated the most? Where do you really anticipate some glitches? Uh, that are going to occur. And uh, what do you think may be the biggest um, constraint uh, of, of that legislation? Like, which do you think it's really the crucial point? Once we pass that, uh, we, we are good to go. We're good to uh, put it into force. Um, Mr. Saliba, I think you can, you can start. It's difficult to assess at this point. It's a very tricky uh, question, Lucy. You tell me which issue will unblock all the other discussions at this point, because there are so many different issues, especially when we're, when we're dealing with the DSA. I'm very, very curious about that also. Which actors are currently, you see in Brussels, in the um, member European Parliament, which actors do you see to be the most active? Like, okay, they are really fighting hard currently. Yes, um, this, is, this is also a question of resources. So uh, the players who have the most resources, the big tech companies basically, uh, they have uh, well-established and big offices uh, policy offices in Brussels, so they can do the outreach more easily. They can fund different debates, activities to influence legislature, legislators and everything. So if you will tell me even by the list of requests of meetings that, that we receive, I would definitely tell you the usual sub suspects, the, the usual GAFAs and big tech companies, which definitely are doing whatever they can to try to influence the most 
uh, this debate, especially, and I always go on that point, even I, I believe big tech companies, um, they, they, they are focusing more on, on DSA issues. Uh, DSA issues from advertising to notice and action to um, profiling recommender systems, etc. So um, those are the most focused uh, at this point. Now, the situation is that Parliament will come up with its official position by uh, a couple of months. Uh, then discussions will be taken on between council, parliament, uh, and, and, and commission. Hopefully, we will see these processes end successfully by the end of this term. We cannot lose focus, we cannot lose track, and we have to focus on, on, on the most important and pertinent issues. And I think this is the, and I would like to conclude with this point, um, DSA and DMA are not the silver bullets to solve all the issues that we have in the ecosystem. Uh, there are so many uh, tricky issues that we have to tackle, but at the same time, we have to be a little bit cautious not to put everything in the same pot uh, because we won't solve anything. We would lose much more time for nothing, for example. There was this big discussion a couple of months ago on, 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 on alternative dispute resolution when it comes to content creators, the discussion in Australia, um, uh, again, reigniting discussion on, article, on, on, on specific articles of the Copyright Directive, which were like the opening again, the Pandora's box. Some are arguing and many content creators are pushing also for this debate although I am totally in favor of trying to find this, this balance uh, and ultimately save our media industry. I am a bit skeptical of reopening sectorial legislation and sectorial issues of copyright law directly uh, under the DMA, DSA discussions. I don't think that it makes sense. So I think that we have to be a little bit cautious. There are those of us who are, it's good to be ambitious, but being over ambitious and trying to solve everything all at once in the same piece of two pieces of legislation that we have, I think that it can risk to ultimately put us in a situation whereby we would have to continue stretching a bit more the definitions under the current 20 year old e commerce directive for a number of years to come. And I think that this would be a lost opportunity, especially right now, especially right now in the midst of a pandemic whereby some of the most pertinent issues, for example, uh, misleading our consumers um, uh, and, and, and other, other issues that right now are more visible because people are more reliant on e-commerce during the restrictions of the pandemic. So I believe that we would be missing a great opportunity if we ultimately try to be too idealistic to solve all the issues at hand and try to uh, put in the same pot other discussions that uh, and, and hot potatoes that we have. So we have to focus on these proposals. Yes, there is room for improvement in the, in the Commission's uh, proposals. There is room for more ambition. Uh, there are some half-baked uh, proposals in the Commission's uh, proposals. So we should focus on that. Uh, there will be a good discussion on that, but to solve all the issues uh, in the world, in the ecosystem, and these led by these two legislations, I think that we would be missing the wood for the trees. Definitely, yeah. So very long to-do list. I unfortunately don't see Mr. Kanonik uh, here, so I'm going to turn to Mr. Kuklish. Very similar question, some kind of outlook for what do you anticipate uh, in upcoming months and which actors do you see to be really the most active um, and, and they will be active as well. Well, I think, you know, as, as Mr. Saliba said, uh, the most active will be the, the biggest platform because they have the most money. We already see in the reports how, you know, the, the lobbyists are really, you know, gathering in Brussels for, for this, uh, you know, purpose. Now, what, what I expect, and I know it's, it's, it's no, I think no surprising, but, but it, is, it is a bit paradoxical because what we hear now, the platforms are saying is that they are not you know, pushing for less obligations. They are, they are kind of pushing for more obligation for everybody. 
which means you know the the, the 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 rational behind this is that they will be because they have the means to tackle you know these these obligations, but small small competitors will not. So I think this is this is a line that we will be hearing uh, now really intensely. But what is interesting also is is the debate around targeted advertising. You know we are hearing that from from the parliament very vocally. You know even even there are voices uh, you know calling for banning. Uh, targeted advertising. So this this is this will be a very intense debate that, that I expect, and it will, it will be also very interesting. And from from the point of view of content regulators, as, as myself and people working in this area, I think you will hear a lot of push uh, for more transparency, though, so to say, and for more meaningful transparency. And also from from the people you know working in the in the protection of, of, of fundamental freedoms, I think you will hear a lot about notice and takedown actions or notice or as an action framework, you know, to be really harmonized and more transparent in the future, because this is something that they they well they were complaining about in the e-commerce directive. And I think it is absolutely right because I already said that a few times uh, today. So this is my take. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I unfortunately don't see Mr. Kanonik to, I think he was saying that he has some internet problems, but I cannot unfortunately see him. Uh, in any case, I our time is unfortunately up and I honestly had about uh, 20 more questions. Uh, we were lucky to at least answer the questions uh, from the audience that we also have from before. So thank you very much for participating, uh, all participants. Thank you very much, uh, panelists, for taking your time to explain it because I think there were many important points. I think the goal, what we, what we were anticipating, to bring really the debate from somewhere, which is often not really reachable for even, uh, even Bratislava, uh, to, to bring it here, uh, that, that happened. Uh, that happened thanks to um, Friedrich Eber Stiftung uh, and their support. Uh, we are once again very grateful and th thankful for working with us, also for uh, to your active team who put that uh, event together um, regarding all, all the little details that are in the background and many of you don't see it often, but especially again uh, to our uh, panelists, um, Mr. Uh, Alex uh, Saliba, uh, from Malta, member of the European Parliament, Mr. Lubos Kuklis uh, from uh, Bratislava, from now the correct uh, name is the Council of Broadcasting and Retransmission of Slovakia. I'm, I'm sorry for missing that. And Mr. Michal Kanonik, president of Zipsy Digital Poland, who unfortunately left. In any case, thank you for the debate. The debate will be definitely uh, available, as I said, on the podcast, uh, still also online uh, on Facebook. Uh, I'm very hopeful that we will have a chance uh, to discuss more about that, maybe more deep into details of all of these topics that we with, that we touched. We see that there is a lot, uh, but I'm pretty sure that up until uh, two more years, perhaps, that, that we're going to discuss, uh, we will have that opportunity. So thank everybody. Thank you, everybody, once again. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.